Mark chapter 6, verse 1 and on. Then he went out from there and came to his own country, and his disciples followed him. And when the Sabbath had come, he began to teach in the synagogue, and many hearing him were astonished, saying, Where did this man get these things? And what wisdom is this which is given to him, that such mighty works are performed by his hands? Is this not the carpenter, the son of Mary, the brother of James, Joseph, Judas, and Simon? And are not his sisters here with us? So they were offended at him. But Jesus said to them, A prophet is not without honor except in his own country, among his own relatives, and in his own house. So he could do no mighty work there, except that he laid hands on a few sick people and healed them. And he marveled because of their unbelief. Then he went about the villages in a circuit teaching. And so here... Jesus is moving in the supernatural, and they are astonished at his words and his works, and he's kind of um, astonished or marveling at their unbelief, and so the power of God is in motion. God is moving. God is working, and when they get offended about what they think they know about him, they then cut themselves off from the supply of what he has that they need. And so this is what offense does. When, when we get offense in our hearts, what it does is it separates us and it blocks us from receiving the things that God is doing right in front of us. Offense, literally, if you wanna, if I can give you a visual, it kind of brings a fence up between you and what God is doing or between you and people. And so it's, it's offense is something that brings division, dishonor, and it stops us from being a part of what God is doing. There's a book that I want to recommend to you for those of you who like to read. There's a book called The Bait of Satan, and it's by a man named John Bevere, and the whole book is about offense, and it's a very good book um, for Christians to consider because offense is something that the enemy usually tries to bring into a community to disrupt it and to uh, make it dysfunctional, unproductive, and uh, basically unfruitful in the work of the kingdom. So that's something to consider um, moving forward. And it says, a prophet is not without honor except in his own country, among his, among his own relatives, and in his own house. And so what happens is sometimes we become familiar with what we think about someone or what we perceive about them. And we actually rob ourselves from the treasure that God has given that person for us. And so Jesus was already moving in the power of God, and they were offended that God was using him because they thought they knew him, and they really didn't know who he actually really was. But they were marveling at, wow, like there is legitimate wisdom and legitimate power flowing from him, and they were offended. And many times people are offended about by what they can't understand or don't understand or can't control. Um, and so to make a long story short, offense really, really shuts us down from the move of God. And it's a really destructive um, thing in relationships. Paul later wrote to one of the churches and he said, we know no man after the flesh. In other words, you don't want to relate to someone based upon the flesh, but you want to re relate to them based upon the spirit and who God created them to be and who they really are. And it's very, very common when you get too familiar with someone that you, you, you shut down your ability to receive. It can happen with pastors. It can happen with, it can even happen with spouses. It can happen with, you know, you may be so aware of your spouse's weakness that you're missing out on the strengths that they may have for you. And, and so you want to be, be careful not to get too familiar um, and, and not to be offended. And we have to really guard our hearts against offense because it's really, it's really something that shuts down the flow of God's uh, power. And it doesn't, it's not like your offense has the ability to shut God down. That's, that's not it. Your offense has the ability to shut you down from receiving what God has. And so I hope that that's an adequate and clear explanation. So verse seven, 
you find the same story in Matthew 10, 1 through 42, and Luke 9, 1 through 6, is that, and he called the 12 to himself and began to send them out two by two and gave them power over unclean spirits. And he commanded them to take nothing for the journey except a staff. This is really interesting. I've never really touched on this before in my preaching, but a staff is something that th this is this is a twofold meaning. Uh, it could be like a rod, like a shepherd's rod, and it could also be a scepter for kings to rule. And it just so happens that they're following the shepherd king. Um, but this staff uh, in the ancient world a staff had carvings on it and it had history on it. And so a staff kind of was like similar to a journal. So he's, the, they're taking their history with them. And so this is really interesting because he says, take your staff with you. And one of the things that we always take with us, whether we acknowledge it or not, is our testimony and our walk with God, whether that walk is lacking or whether that walk is on point. Whenever we go out into the world to share the gospel and to preach and to pray for people and love on people, um, we're going with our staff, whether we have a stick or not. And our staff is really our testimony and our history with God. And he tells them, take no bag, no bread, no copper in their money belts, uh, but to wear sandals and not to put on two tunics or two coats. So he's teaching them not to rely on their preparation, their provision, money, um, he's teaching them to rely and to be dependent upon him. You cannot really represent someone that you're not dependent on. Um, it's very, very important that we build history with God and we learn to get to know him because if we want to represent him well, we've got to know him, we've got to walk with him, and we've got to have our trust in him. Verse 10, also he said to them, in whatever place you enter a house, stay there till you depart from that place and whoever will not receive you nor hear you when you depart from there shake off the dust under your feet as a testimony against them assuredly i say to you it will be more tolerable for sodom and gomorrah in the day of judgment than for that city i want to touch on this because this is a, this is this very serious um word and when god wants to have mercy on a city or on a people he sends apostles or disciples or prophets he sends his people with his message that people might respond to his message and receive mercy if they don't receive mercy they bring upon themselves judgment judgment was not god's intention that was their will not god's god sent disciples to release the kingdom of god to bring righteousness to bring peace to bring joy to bring healing to bring grace to bring the good news but they rejected it. And so when he says it'll be more tolerable for Sodom and Gomorrah in that day than for that city, he's making a specific reference to how Rome will come and conquer Jerusalem in 70 AD. Rome surrounded the army, uh, the, the Roman army surrounded the city of Jerusalem for months and starved them to death. And it was a slow and very, very, very painful bleed out it was a slow torture so when he said it'll be more tolerable than for sodom and gomorrah what happened to sodom and gomorrah the judgment of god fell on the city in an instant the city was gone so it's kind of like shooting someone in the head and having mercy on them by just killing them or torturing them for days and weeks on end and not that I'm telling you to do any of that. It's like, what did we learn in the Bible study tonight? Shoot somebody in the head and, you know, not torture them. No, that's not what I'm saying. I'm just saying that what he's saying here is that what happened to Sodom and Gomorrah happened quickly, instantly, and it was over versus what's going to happen to these cities that reject the gospel. It's going to be a slow and painful bleed out by Rome, and it's going to be ugly, and it's going to be painful, um, and it's going to be slow. And so now here's here's the thing that I want you to uh, think about, because there's there's a piece of this that is prophetic. It's historical. But then there's a truth in this same passage that is very important for those who want to do ministry and who want to be effective with people. It says this shake off the dust from under your feet as a testimony against them. What that means is do not embody rejection. Do not re let rejection get on you. 
Do not let rejection get in you. Do not let rejection control or manipulate you. Shake it off. Don't internalize it. Don't let it get on you. Don't let it get in you. Shake it off and move forward. And that, w- that which you shake off is actually a testimony against them because the gospel that was for them, when they reject it, it becomes against them. So that's uh, a truth there. Tw- uh, 12. So they went out and preached that people should repent. Now, we think of repent, we think of feel guilty, feel sorry, be angry, be mad at ourselves, be, uh, you know, self-pity. You know, no, that's not what he's saying. He's saying that people should repent. They should change the way they think because of what they're hearing and seeing. That's very, very important, especially, let's say, for example, let's just, here's a great example of repentance that is often overlooked, but it's very powerful in our life. Let's say you grew up around all dysfunctional people, you know, you, your parents were married a few times or, you know, your dad was unfaithful to your mom or whatever. You just grew up in just dysfunction or abuse, neglect, neglect is abuse. But let's just say you grew up around dysfunction and then you get older and you start hanging around with people that seem to be like kind of like normal people. Like they go to church, they go to work, they pay their bills, they don't cheat on their wife, their wife doesn't, you know, flatten their tires with, uh, you know, a butcher knife. You know, they're like kind of like normal people and you start getting around these people and you're going, man, I could kind of be normal too. Maybe, maybe the way we speak to each other isn't normal. And so then you start to reframe how you think and how you speak because you're around and you're hearing and you're seeing something that is different. So that's an example of repentance without like this whole bad guilt trip of shame and anger and disappointment now do we feel godly sorrow yes does godly sorrow work repentance it does it's beautiful it's holy it's important but repentance is not always just feeling guilty and frustrated and crying that's confession that's great but he he, he's saying to them within this context the kingdom of god is coming it's here god is moving and now it's important that you reframe how you think that you repent that you respond to what god is doing and that you respond to what you're hearing and seeing this is very very important james says you can be a hearer of the word but if you don't do the word you're deceiving yourself many people are self-deceived even though they hear the truth week after week after week because they don't do anything with what they heard so uh that's that's something that within repentance that's something that we should consider 13 and they cast out many demons and anointed with oil many who were sick and healed them 14 now king herod heard of him for his name had become well known so jesus sends them out his guys the disciples and his name becomes well known the purpose of us going out is to make jesus known the purpose of ministry is to put jesus on display even the name of our ministry, we see Jesus Ministries. It's about the obedience of faith, putting Jesus on display. Psalm 23 says, David wrote, you anoint my head with oil. If you read the biblical narrative in the book of Samuel, you learn that Jesus and, and, and God did not anoint David with oil. Samuel did. But it was through Samuel's obedience that Jesus was put on display. And through Samuel obeying God, David was able to see past Samuel to the God who commanded Samuel. And that was personal history with David and God through someone else's obedience. When you choose to walk in obedience, you become a part of someone's personal, intimate history with God. It's, it's something that it's hard to, uh, to explain, but when you're a part of that, it is a great blessing and you should take it seriously. Uh, and not take advantage of it. Now, King Herod heard of him for his name had become well known. And he said, John, the Baptist is risen. Here's his guilt talking (laughs) from the dead. And therefore these powers are at work in him. So this man, Herod had John killed and Herod obviously feels guilty. And he obviously believes in resurrection because he thinks that, that John is, is Jesus and raised from the dead. And And let me just say one thing. Political people usually don't understand truth. Um, They don't understand the gospel. They have all these weird ideas. 
And so that's true now, and it's true then. So anyway, 15 others said, it's Elijah. See, now he's hearing from people. Look at who, check this out. Here you have King Herod. He's a powerful person. He's misinformed. He has no idea what's going on. And there's other people who are speaking to him who don't know what's going on. That's something to think about. Th think about this. This is, this is, he thinks he's a king. He's going to find out later he's not a king. But at, at this point, he thinks he's in charge. In addition to him not knowing what's going on, the people who are speaking to him do not know what's going on either. This is why prophets belong speaking the word of the Lord to people in politics because they don't know what's going on. So anyway, that was, that's another message. And others said it's a prophet like one of the prophets. But when Herod heard, he said, this is John. And now he's confident in his ignorance. Uh, but when Herod heard, he said, this is John whom I beheaded. He has been raised from the dead for Herod himself had sent and laid hold of John and bound him in prison for the sake of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, for he had married her. Because John said to Herod, it is not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. Powerful people are not used to someone telling them no. They're not used to someone opposing them. They're not used to someone telling them what you're doing is wrong. So Herodias got offended and watch what's going to happen. Then Herodias held it against him and wanted to kill him, but she could not. For Herod feared John, knowing that he was a just and holy man, and he protected him. And when he heard him, he did many things and heard him gladly. Then an opportune day came when Herod, on his birthday, gave a feast for his nobles and high officers and the chief men of Galilee. The who's who of Galilee is there. And when Herod's daughter watched this, Herodias' daughter herself came in and danced and pleased Herod and those who sat with him the king said to the girl ask me whatever you want and I will give it to you he also swore to her whatever you ask I will give to you up to half of my kingdom so he went out and said to her mother so she went out and said to her mother what shall I ask and she said, the head of John the Baptist, immediately she came in with haste to the king and asked, saying, I want you to give me at once the head of John the Baptist on this platter. And the king was exceedingly sorry, yet because of his oaths and because of those who sat with him, he did not want to refuse her. 27. And immediately, immediately rather, the king sent an executioner and commanded his head to be brought and he went and beheaded him in prison and brought his head on a silver platter and gave it to the girl and the girl gave it to her mother when his disciples heard of it they came and took away his corpse and laid it in a tomb then the apostles gathered to jesus and told him all things both what they had done and what they had taught and he said to them come aside by yourselves to a deserted place and rest for a while for there were many coming and going and they did not even have time to eat this is uh really powerful i want to show you what lust and what pride does lust and pride working together help take john's head off and so now this king is looking at his wife's daughter and the way she's dancing is pleasing him this is a perverse spirit. This is not, this is not, there's perversion in this family. He took his brother's wife and now he's looking at his wife's daughter and he's pleased by her dancing. So there's a spirit of perversion here and perversion always makes promises. And so now he's saying, I'll give you whatever you want. And so perversion and pride are talking. And when perversion and pride get the best of you, you make promises that you, you wouldn't want to keep later. And so what happens is she asks her mom and her mom had an offense in her heart because John told the truth. And John loses his head for telling the truth. But even in John losing his head, John is actually fulfilling his prophetic vocation because he's supposed to prepare the way of the Lord 
and he's supposed to tell the people who's Israel's true king. And by him saying that you can't marry your brother's wife, that's a way of him also fulfilling his vocation to say that the true king of Israel doesn't behave like that. That is not the kingdom of God. That is not how God's people should interact with the world. And so even his rebuke on the perversion of this king taking his brother's wife was part of him fulfilling his prophetic vocation. Prophetic vocation often is not just about forecasting the future, although that's great. Often prophetic vocation, uh, the prophetic assignment is giving people God's heart and God's mind on a matter. Often the prophetic is most often given through someone offering an alternate perspective to a situation. It's kind of like God will give a heavenly perspective to an earthly situation, and that is prophetic because it's releasing the heart and the mind of God. So I hope that that is helpful. Jesus is observing his guys, and he says, come aside by yourselves to a deserted place and rest for a while. So Jesus is aware that his guys need rest and that's important to him. Here's what I would uh, like to say to you when you're discipling people, when you're being discipled, um, when you're a father or a husband, you, you have to know when the people that are entrusted to your care need a break. And one of the ways that you use your spiritual authority and influence is by helping to facilitate a break for other people. This is a beautiful thing in a marriage. Maybe your wife looks extra tired and you stand up and you do the dishes, or maybe your husband needs to eat dinner. And so you sacrifice being tired and you cook anyway. These are just practical things, but we, in caring for people, we have to know when we tell them, hey, it's probably time for you to take a chill pill and rest and, 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 and kind of just chill out. All right. That's actually very, very important. This is a part of the story for a reason. If you want to last, you've got to learn to rest. Resting is a choice. It's a decision. Resting is an act of trust. Uh, it's very, very important. When you trust God, you can rest. Okay. Verse 32, this story is also found in Matthew 14, 13 through 21, Luke 9, 11 through 17, and John 6, 1 through 14. This is the feeding of the 5,000. This is in all four gospels. So they departed to a deserted place in the boat by themselves. But the multitude saw them departing and many knew him and ran there on foot from all the cities they arrived before them and came together to him. And Jesus, when he came out, saw a great multitude and was moved with compassion for them because they were like sheep, not having a shepherd. I want to say this to us. This is very important. Compassion is not something that helps us criticize people more accurately. Compassion allows us to see people's true condition. And he was able through compassion to see them and to see that they were scattered and they were people with no, no shepherd. And in the ancient world, no direction and no protection. They're kind of just existing and kind of just a little bit lost. And ma many Christians, I hate to say this, live their life like that. They're, they're kind of just existing. They're not really thriving. They're not really by green pastures and still waters being refreshed they're just kind of like just kind of stumbling through and that is not the calling of god we should have a shepherd we should be shepherded and we should allow him to lead us and give us sure instructions and clear directions all right so he began to teach them many things when the day was now far spent his disciples came to him and said this is a deserted place and already the hour is late. Send them away that they may go into the surrounding countries and villages and buy themselves bread for they have nothing to eat. But he answered and said to them, you give them something to eat. When you pray, 
don't just bring your problems to Jesus. When you pray, expect to become a part of the solution. This is part of whether we know it or not, they're praying. <laughs> they're going to God with a problem. <laughs> and God wants to make them part of the solution. So if you see a problem, ask the Lord how you can be a part of the solution. And they said to him, shall we go and buy 200 denarii worth of bread and give them something to eat? So their first response is natural. They're in the natural. They are anchored in the natural. And Jesus is, is trying to teach them to see beyond that. Watch this. But he said to them, how many loaves do you have? Go and see. And when they found out, they said five and two fishes. Then he commanded them to make them all sit down in groups on the green grass. Remember it said that he'll lead us be, to green pastures and still waters. Come on, look at this. Then he commanded them to make them sit down in groups on the green grass. And they sat down in ranks in fifties and in hundreds in hundreds and in fifties. And when he had taken the five loaves and the two fish, he looked up to heaven, blessed it and broke the loaves and gave them to his disciples to set them before them. And the two fish he divided among them. So they all ate and were filled and they took up 12 baskets full of fragments of the fish now, those who had eaten the loaves were about 5,000 men. This is beautiful. The food did not multiply in Jesus's hand. The food multiplied in the hands of the people that wanted to send them away. Jesus is taking the mentality of the disciples from lack to leftovers. Some of you are used to having lack in your life. I've been there. It's not a fun place. God wants you to get used to having leftovers. God wants you to realize that in his kingdom, there's abundance. God wants you to live in abundance. And that abundance starts with your perspective. And this is important because whatever God blesses, he breaks. And if, if you're going to be a blessing, you're going to get broken. <laughs> and you're going to get passed out and and you're going to be bred as well for people so anyway this is really important he sits them down in 50s and in hundreds order is what facilitates the blessing of god order is what facilitates uh the movement of god you have to get things in order without proper order whatever you're going to do is going to become so messy and so unsustainable it's like People who don't know where they put stuff, they're always losing stuff. If that's your life, then you, you need to get everything in order because you waste a lot of time where you could be productive looking for things that you should know where they are so that you could use them. That's really something that there's things that are in the natural that also are anchored in the spiritual, like someone who's always getting lost and someone who's always confused, someone who's always misunderstanding situations. There's heart issues that affect how you're seeing reality that God wants to deal with so that those issues in the outside part of your life are fixed. Um, anyway, so now he divided among them and they all ate and were filled. And guess who takes the, the, the baskets home? The 12 guys. You know, you know, what's funny. You don't hear Judas talking about, hey, man, we should be selling these fish and these loaves here. We could give them to the poor. <laughs> you don't hear Judas talking like that. Interesting. Anyway, that was a free comment. So this is really interesting because the, the scripture says that God takes pleasure in the prosperity of his servants. God wants his people to live in abundance. If that's offensive to you, I'm sorry, but God wants you to have more than enough. And God is reshaping his disciples because they go from lack to leftovers. And they're the people that wanted to send everyone home. And they're the guys that are leaving with the leftovers. 
So they go from this place of how is this going to all work to God is training their hearts and their eyes. And see, let me just say something. When, when, when people, when Jesus looked up, the psalmist said, I look to the hills from whence cometh my help. When you pray, get in the habit of looking up. If I know someone is going to hand me something, right? Someone's going to give me a Holy Ghost handshake. I'm not going to walk up to them and close my eyes. When Jesus prayed, and even in John 17, he looked up. Because there was expectation and faith. Faith looks up. Expectation looks up. Get in the habit of looking up. He looked up to heaven. And I could just, just, I could just imagine him. I'm not saying that this is happening. I'm just saying my imagination. I could just imagine him thinking about the glory that he had with the father before the foundation of the world and how there was always enough in God's world. I could imagine him looking up to father and just saying, show them who you are. And as they passed it out, it was multiplied. It, it's, it multiplies when you let go. When you let go. Now, when you hold on. It multiplies when you let go. And there's so much here because he sits them down. And when someone sits down, they're getting ready to receive. When someone sits down in groups of 50 or in hundreds, he's sitting them down and setting an order. But let me explain one thing to you. When they're being seated, now the people who are seated are able to see what God's doing because it's not a big crowd of people bum rushing you like it's Haiti or the Dominican Republic for, you know, boots or whatever uh, or food. They're sitting down and they're watching what God is doing. Sometimes people need to see it so that was before the youtube channel but they're watching it and through the obedience to jesus's commands bread is multiplying because in the father's world where jesus is from there's no lack there's another scripture um that says may the pleasure of the lord prosper in your hands and so if you're someone that used to use your hands for bad things, that's a good scripture to quote over yourself. I pray that over myself that may the pleasure of the Lord prosper in my hands. May the things that honor the Lord and bring him joy and pleasure, may they prosper through my hands. May they be released through my hands. All right. That's from Isaiah. Okay. We'll go into 45. Immediately, he made his disciples get into the boat. <laughs> Peter immediately. Mr. Immediately. <laughs> Peter's nickname. Immediately, he made his disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side, to Bethsaida, where he sent the multitude away. And when he had sent them away, he departed to the mountain to pray. One of the things about the multitudes is you have to learn how to send them away. I know that that's hard, especially if you want to get, you know, grow a crowd. But Jesus didn't only grow a crowd. He also sent them away. Um, anyway, okay. When he had sent them away, he departed to the mountain to pray. Now when evening had came, the boat was in the middle of the sea and was alone. And he was alone on the land. Then he saw them straining and rowing, for the wind was against them. Now, about the fourth watch of the night, about 3 a.m., he came to them, walking on the sea, and would have passed them by. And when they saw him walking on the sea, they supposed it was a ghost and cried out, for they all saw him and were troubled. But immediately, he talked to them and said to them, be of good cheer, be happy. <laughs> They're having a meltdown. Be happy. Be of good cheer. It is I. Do not be afraid. What is he dealing with again? The fear. 
Oh, I'm not afraid, Jesus. Well, your face looks afraid. He always wants to reassure them that he's with them. And because he's with them, they don't have to be afraid. Then he went up into the boat and the wind ceased. And they were greatly amazed in themselves beyond measure and marveled, for they had not understood the loaf about the loaves because their heart was hardened. Now, this is this is interesting. They could not understand. They could not make a mental connection. They could not put two and two together because their heart was hardened. And uh, one of the, the word for hardened, guess what it is? It's blind. Because their heart was blind, They could not perceive. They could not put it together. They couldn't understand it. They, they didn't understand that the last thing that Jesus had just conquered was training for the next thing that they were going to go through. What their eyes just saw still hasn't ratified and transformed their heart. They're in process. <laughs> um, they're in a process of learning to see things differently. So this is really unique because here's, here's how we can apply this to our life now, right? Whatever you were just going through, God was preparing you for what you're about to go through. So God is training your heart to see and to perceive. So when you experience the provision of God, when you experience the power of God, God is training you for the next situation that you're going to find yourself in. It's interesting how their hearts were blind. Watch this. And they were also afraid. A heart that is blind is one that is afraid. Years ago, the Lord asked me a question because I got very frustrated with the church folks. And I don't, I don't even think if it was really rescue church folks. That was another level of pain. But I was very frustrated with dealing with the church because the church is really not easy to deal with. And I was very upset. And the Lord asked me a question. He said, if you saw a blind man walk into a telephone pole, would you feel angry or compassion? And I said, wow, I would feel compassion because he's blind. You, you know, he didn't. And the Lord is like, yeah, you see? So there's people that you, you want to be angry at but they really need, they really need compassion. You need, you need compassion to see their true condition and their true condition is blindness. When someone is afraid, it's because they're blind. When someone's heart is unable to see and they're unable to understand, it's because they have been preoccupied by other situations and they have not really been embracing the training that the Lord is bringing them through. I don't know if, if this is making sense to you, but this is very, very simple because God is a good God. And whatever you're going through now, he's preparing you for where you're going to walk through later. You're in training. You're in process. God is preparing you. And it's the process that makes you ready for his purposes. It's the process that makes you ready for his promises. It's being in his presence that gives you the ability to perceive what he's doing and, and so th these are just things that as we walk with him he cultivates our sight and our ability to discern and to tie together the things that he's doing and to participate with him right okay 53 and when they had crossed over they came to the land of Gennesaret and anchored there 
And when they came out of the boat immediately, the people recognized him and ran through the whole surrounding region and began to carry about on beds those who were sick to whatever they, uh, excuse me, to those who were sick to wherever they heard he was. So wherever he is, they're going there. Whenever he entered into villages, cities, or the country, they laid the sick in the marketplaces and begged him that they just might touch the hem of his garments. And as many as touched him were made well. Now, this hem is referring to, I'll give you new numbers. Speak to the children of Israel. Tell them to make tassels on the corners of their garments throughout their generations and to put a blue thread in the tassels on the corners. Blue stands for royalty. <laughs> so anyway, royalty is kingdom. He is the king and the high priest. And that is the vocation of Messiah. And when they pull on his garments, that is the manifestation of the high priestly ministry of Jesus. And that ministry wasn't in a temple because he's the temple and he's the Passover lamb and he's the high priest and he's a sacrifice. Um, and he's the sweet smelling aroma that rises to, the, to God. So it's, it's all about him. Um, and so anyway, his, the manifestation of his messiahship is being manifested as these people are pulling on the hem of his garments. And, and the principle there is that a touch from Jesus and you'll never be the same. And that, that, is, that is the will of God. God became flesh so that we could behold his glory, so that we could touch him, so that he could touch us, so that he could interact with us, so that he could, he could feel us, so that we could see him, so that we could know him, so that we could understand that he understands us. And though he was tempted in all ways, yet he didn't compromise and he, he, he set the example and he was faithful, and uh, he gives us a model of faithfulness to follow. And uh, the, the reality here is that they are now flocking to him because they can depend on that if they touch him, they'll never be the same. And um, that, is, that is faith, that is expectation. And when you press in and, and that's your expectation, God meets you there. And um, some of us need to lift up our expectations because we've maybe experienced a bunch of disappointment or maybe you prayed for the sick and they weren't healed uh, or whatever it is. But we need to lift up our level of expectation. Like I'm headed to Haiti next week. I absolutely 100% expect miracles. I believe in a supernatural God. I believe Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today and forever. And I believe the type of stuff that we're reading in here should be normal for Christians because Jesus hasn't changed his mind and the needs of the world are still here. And God wants to show that he's King and he's Lord and he's, you know, and he's daddy and he loves them. And, and if they touch him, they'll never be the same. And so anyway, that kind of concludes Mark uh, six. For those of you who want to sow into the ministry, you can go to we see Jesus ministries.com slash give slash partners, or you could give, uh, via Zell at 201-562-6335. Or another thing that you can do uh, is you can partner with us with our projects. Uh, today, we actually had a pretty good day and we're seeing the Zambia project spike up. Some of us uh, from rescue are actually going to Zambia in April and we're going to be a part of uh, being a blessing to the nation of Zambia. So that's ways that you can kind of connect and support the ministry. And if this blessed you, I would love for you to share it um, on YouTube, Facebook, or through your email list. Bless you guys.